Hey everyone, what's up? It's Rob Dotson. Welcome to a very special IO edition of Polycast. Today we're going to be talking about styling and theming elements and how all that just got way better in the new release of Polymer. I really think you're going to enjoy this, so let's check it out. So I'm going to start with a little story about Polymer 05 because this is an issue that tripped up a lot of folks. In Polymer 05, if you had a component that had some internal styles, and then you had some more specific CSS styles in the document, when you took that component over to polyfilled browsers like Safari or Internet Explorer, you might see one thing, and then in Chrome, where there's native Shadow DOM, you would see something different. In other words, if you had more specific CSS in the document, it could totally wreck your component. And this tripped up a lot of beginners who, who were just getting started with Polymer, and thought perhaps it just didn't work in all browsers, which is not the case. It's just it's very, very difficult to properly polyfill CSS scoping. So let me give you an example of, of what this looks like, just so you can kind of internalize it. In one of the uh, previous episodes of Polycast, we created this quick alert tag here, which is basically like a little notification you might send to a user. And in that episode, I wanted to style this div down here, so I used this alert style. But imagine if, instead of using a class selector here, if I just styled the div element by itself. Now, this is totally fine. This, this would you know, give us that same example. The problem is just that it's not very specific. And so what could happen is my buddy might be working somewhere else in the site, totally oblivious to what I'm doing, and he might create an alert class as well, just to target some other element on the page. And he could style it you know, with some weird fonts and background colors and what have you. And then when I go in the next morning, I look at my quick alert tag, it's, it's all busted. It's in Comic Sans. It looks all messed up. And for a lot of folks, they saw this, and they just thought, ah, this stuff just doesn't work. But really, the problem is you just can't very effectively polyfill CSS scoping. It's, it's a pretty tricky thing to do. But the team decided, you know, perhaps there could be a better alternative to what we currently had. And so I'm happy to introduce you to the new custom style tag. Now, this is a type extension of the style element. If you recall, in a previous episode, we talked all about type extension elements and how they work. And the cool thing about the custom style tag is it allows you to put your document CSS inside of it. And these styles are basically not going to be able to affect or mess up any of the components that you have on your page in polyfill browsers. It's a really great way to get lower bound style scoping in Polymer in the newest release. I think it's pretty awesome. So now you know how to protect your elements from document level styles in polyfilled browsers. The next thing I want to show you is how to actually theme whole element sets using some cool new techniques. Now, at last year's I.O., I showed off a couple of ways that you could theme an element using some shadow piercing selectors. So there was colon, colon, shadow pseudo element, which would allow you to pierce one level into the shadow boundary. And in this example, target this slider knob thing inside of my paper slider. There was also the deep combinator, which allows you to pierce like infinite levels of shadow boundaries. And in this case, I'm targeting all the little ink effects inside of here by actually hitting the ID. But there are some problems with shadow and deep. First and foremost, they totally break encapsulation. Like in those examples, I had to know specific ID names of elements inside of my web components to target them, which means if the author moved those things around or changed the names at any point, my theme would break. Also, shadow and deep kind of screw up some potential performance gains. There's this idea that you could improve style recalculation using shadow DOM if it wasn't possible to pierce inside of it, but that sort of goes out the window. Uh, lastly, and, and I think this is pretty important, both Shadow and Deep are, are sort of imprecise tools. They're kind of like sledgehammers. In particular, Deep is, is kind of a, a main offender here because it can pierce so many levels and, and do so many things. So the team thought that perhaps there would be a better way to do theming and styling in the new release of Polymer. And one of the areas that we've been exploring is around CSS variables. So let me show you an example of how this could work. I've got an element that I've created here called UI message, and it is pretty generic. It's got a container, and then a header and content area inside of it. And then I've just got some data bindings to these properties down here that I've created. Now I'm going to hide my JavaScript definition, just so I can focus on the markup up here. 
And I want to add some styles. So I'm going to target the host and give it an inline block style. I'm also going to target that container and set its background color to gray and give it a little bit of padding. And this is going to give me a very generic looking sort of UI message thing. Now, it's pretty boring. But let's say someone actually wanted to use this in their project. And the first thing they wanted to do was change that header color. So to do that using CSS variables, we can actually target the header class, target the color property, and then give it a variable here. So I'm saying that the value of UI message header color should set my color property. Now, I know that this syntax is pretty funky. But this is the syntax, this is the you know, standard syntax for CSS3 variables. And the cool thing about this is it allows the author to expose a styling point to the outside world. But you know, someone using this component doesn't actually need to know specifically where this variable is being used. They just know that you know, there's a header color variable somewhere it gets applied. So elsewhere, I'm creating a theme for this component. I've got a custom style element. And it's very important that if you're using variables, that you place them inside of custom style elements because it gives Polymer one place to look for these uh, variable declarations. I'm going to target the UI message tag. I'm going to target that variable, and I'll pass in a value of white. And what that's going to do is give me a header that is white. Now, this is really cool because as a consumer of the element, I don't need to know anything about the internals. I can just set a value for that variable, and then the author can choose to use it however they wish. But there's a catch here. If we have to define a variable for like every single property inside of our element, then we're going to end up with thousands of variables in no time. And we definitely don't want that. So this is where things actually get kind of interesting. The Polymer team has been working on an experimental new theming system that takes advantage of CSS custom properties. It's experimental, like I said, but totally awesome. So I want to show you how that works. Now, one of the things that would be cool is if we could pass in not just you know, one variable at a time, but actually pass in a whole bunch of properties all at once. There is a concept similar to this in CSS preprocessors like SAS or less called mixins. And this is something that the Polymer team has been working with the CSS standards body to add to the current spec. It's this idea of taking custom properties that allow you to pass in whole bags of values all at once. So let me show you how that works. This is pretty cool. So let's take our header thing here. And instead of just doing this one variable, I'm going to create a few what are called custom properties. So I've still got my sort of default styles that I started with in my container. But now I'm using this syntax to say, hey, I want to apply a custom property called UI message container theme. I want to apply a UI message header theme and a content theme. And what this allows me to do is go back to my theme file and replace this one variable with those custom properties. Notice that there's a semicolon on the end here. This is important for the syntax and something that I often leave off. And now I can actually pass in just like whole bags of properties that I would like to override the default styles in that element. Now, I borrowed these styles from the Semantic UI library just to show that you can go you know, hog wild here. You can pass in as much CSS as you could possibly imagine. And what this is going to do is take our totally boring vanilla UI message and turn it into something that's actually much more pleasant. So over in my code editor, I've got a Bower JSON file fired up. And I am, in my dependencies, listing Polymer 09 RC1 as one of my dependencies. Now, it's been a few weeks since this has been recorded, so you're probably safe at this point to just go ahead and replace this with the actual 090 tag. And once you've got that in place, you can install it. It'll pull down the latest version of Polymer. And over in my UI message file, this is the same element that I was showing over in the slides. And the first thing I'm going to do is create a little header variable. And that's just going to allow me to change the color of this header down here. I can create a my theme HTML file and add a custom style element to that. I can create a my theme HTML file and add a custom style element to that. 
And inside of here, I'm going to target the UI message element, and I'll pass in a value for that variable. And now when I'm ready to use these guys, I can just import the definition for my UI message and import the theme that I just created. And then I can just drop the UI message tag on the page, and that theme is going to be applied to it. So if I hop over to Chrome, we'll see my message, and we see that updated header color. Now let's try to do this with some custom properties. So we'll go back to our element definition. And instead of just the one variable, I'm going to use the at sign apply syntax to create custom properties for container theme, header theme, and content theme. And then back in my theme HTML file, I can replace this one variable with those custom properties. Again, note the semicolons here. I always forget to include those. And then I'll just paste in a bunch of CSS styles. Again, these are the styles that I borrowed from Semantic UI. But you can see that you, know, you can pass in whatever you want, box shadow and color and opacity, what have you. All of these are going to be applied, and they're going to override the defaults that are in that UI message element. So go back to Chrome and refresh the page, and now things are looking much nicer. Now this is a huge improvement over where we were with theming and styling in previous versions of Polymer. And personally, I'm just really excited to see what you all build with it. That's it for today. Be sure to click that little subscribe button. Leave me questions down in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hey there, Polycasters. Rob here. Q&A time. Uh, Lucas Ceruzzi sends in three questions. Uh, the first is, is the underscore notation mandatory when you're defining an observer in your properties object? It's a good question, Lucas. Uh, the underscore is actually not mandatory. That's just something that we include to signify that a function is private and that we don't want the outside world calling that method. But by no means is it required. It's just sort of a stylistic thing. Second question, how would you implement an attribute change listener on a native web component? So something that isn't using Polymer or anything like that, just a vanilla custom element. To do that, you can use the attribute change callback. That is a lifecycle callback that every custom element has. And that callback is going to give you three arguments, the attribute name that changed, the old value, and the new value. Uh, last question is, how does the read-only property affect a custom element when I change that protected property from the outside using something like set attribute? In that case, what you're going to see is the DOM element is going to update, but the property inside of it is going to remain the same. So if you have a binding to that property or something like that, that binding is going to stay exactly as it was. So great questions, Lucas. Thank you for sending those in. If you have questions, please leave them for us down in the comments. We'll try to answer them all, maybe feature you on the show and get you some swag. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.